All right, as I've mentioned to you before at verse 9, the Lord asked a question to man. Why? To get conviction out of him. It's not because God is dumb and stupid where he says, Adam, I don't know where you are. Where are you? It's because it becomes more powerful when you address a person by name and ask him a question. And where's Tom Cho? I did that last time. Oh, I can't chew him out again. All right, so he's in Sunday school class teaching the kids, obviously. So uh, I can't do that anymore. But as you might recall, it gives an uncomfortable atmosphere because it's chewing somebody out. It's demanding an answer from him. Now notice that it differs from verse 9, God's questioning, from Satan's questioning at chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 is the devil making them break God's command and getting them to doubt God's command. And then verse 9, God is basically convicting them of why they broke his command. So that's how the devil and God uses their questioning. Usually God, what he does is that he questions you. But then the devil, what he does is he makes you question God. So that would be incredibly life-changing in your life. The problem with higher education school is what they do is that they question uh, God or whatever they deem to be the majority, but what they mean is the Bible and Christianity. So they get you to question that to increase your critical thinking, but proper higher education is where you question yourself. You have to be questioning yourself on what you believe to be true or not. Now, if we look at verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. So Adam replies to God's question, hey, where are you, Adam? And he says, I heard your voice in the garden. I heard, you uh, I heard you talking. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So he says here that he was afraid of God's voice being present in the garden. Why? Because I'm naked. I don't want God to see you. Uh, I don't want God for you to see me naked. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. And I hid myself. So he hid himself. He didn't want to reveal himself. Now, God replies this, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? So he says, who told you that you are naked? I never told you that. When did you find out that you were naked, Adam? Then he asks him, hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So he's asking him this question, did you eat from the fruit of the tree that I directly, specifically commanded you that you are not supposed to eat. Now remember, the point of this Bible study is literally verse by verse, every word for word, so that you can understand. A lot of people, they struggle with their own Bible reading because they say that the English wording is hard to understand. So that's the point of this verse by verse Bible study. It'll give you a common sense gist of every single word. So as I teach and try to interpret every single word to you, see if it lines up. Read the verse and understand every single word yourself when you do that. And if there's something you're struggling with and then you hear me teach it and explain it, it's going to click. Okay? So I've said this a thousand times, but I just want to keep saying that. We see so much of human nature here. Human psychology is extremely rich from these passages. Verse 12, and the man said, so Adam replies back, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. Now notice the wording here. Adam says, the woman that you gave to me, God, Eve, who you gave to me, I mean, I didn't ask for her, I mean, you gave her to me, you're the one, she gave us me of the tree and I did eat. So Eve directed him, gave him the fruit from off the tree, and Adam says that he did eat. And then at verse 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, so the Lord God now speaks to the woman, okay? It, it's like how a parent talks to the children, right? Well, he did it, and then the parent goes to the next child. Is that really true? What did you do? And then it just goes back and forth, the blame game, right? What is this that thou hast done? So he asked the woman, well, man, what, what's this thing that you did? You just ruined everything. What happened here? What did you do? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So the woman replies back, well, Satan, the serpent, he deceived, he charmed me with his this deception, and I ate the fruit off the tree. 
And then there's a different branch of philosophy from Sartre, if I pronounced his last name right, with phenomenology. And these two branches, psychology and phenomenology, what they shared in common is that religion, uh, uh, man conjured it up within their minds. Why? It's so that they can have an explanation to natural catastrophes or nature itself that they fear and then in order to find an explanation to their fear of nature and fear of catastrophe, they just put God within the picture. So in other words, mankind, because of fear, they just put God within their conscience. So that's the heresy and that's the blasphemy of psychology and phenomenology. This is the passage that shows what God has given to every man despite of their fallen human nature. And that's the power of conscience. And Romans chapter 2 shows that the Lord gives you this conscience to convict you. So people, they can't get scot free from their sin because the Lord gave them a conscience and every man has a conscience. Every man tries to justify their actions. That's why we have courts. Why? Because it's to judge you for the wrongdoing that you've done. And that's why people, they try to hire lawyers. Why? To give an explanation for their actions. Now look at Romans chapter 2. Notice that there's conviction over conscience. And then we'll look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law. See that? So you may not have a direct law. And Adam and Eve, uh, the law that they had was just not eat the fruit off the tree. But they didn't have all the details either. Yet look what the Lord gave them. Do by nature. See that? Human nature. Things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So notice here that their conscience is the one that uh, convicts them, that shows them what they did is wrong. Their heart convicts them. Now notice the latter part of verse 15 is what Adam and Eve did. And their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. See that? They're passing the blame game. Why? Because the conscience is convicting them. And that's the dangers of psychology. All right, let's go back to Genesis. Uh, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter, uh, it will be 1 Timothy, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse two verse two but we'll start off at verse one verse one and two now notice how the pattern goes the pattern goes if you have a conscience then why aren't you convicted romans 2 gave you the steps here one of the first steps is where you actually give excuses it goes from you have a conscience that convicts then it goes to excuses. Then it goes to where? It goes to, uh, let's see here. There's the tempter, seduce, so to speak. And then defile. And then when you defile it, you can't hear it practically. You lose the conviction. That's the most dangerous thing you can ever get into is that where you get convicted of sin and you lost. Why? Because it goes by a pattern here. Now look at this pattern. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. We saw conscience and excuses, right? Those were the first two. Now look at the next parts. Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. So you lose your belief giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. So if you fall into that seduction, what happened? That feeling of seduction replaces the feeling of guilt and conviction. And then you listen to the lies of your psychiatrists and psychologists and your positive thinking preachers and the atheist and liberal community that uh, justify sin and homosexuality. And then what happens? Then at verse 2, speaking, uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. See that? 
So now you defile the conscience. You sear the conscience like a hot iron, so it's so much used to hearing the conviction that it got used to it, and it's no longer bothered. No longer bothered. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Genesis 3. There's so much to see on human psychology here. Long before Freud gave his psychoanalytical babble. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Verse 13. Okay, here we go. This is the deep doctrine. All right. The deep doctrine here that we can learn is concerning about something happening between the woman and the serpent, which is pretty, pretty strange. Now, notice what the woman said about the serpent. The serpent beguiled. Did you notice that? Now, that word that she used, let's look at a familiar passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, if you look up the word beguiled, I don't know if you knew this, it means deceive, but this deception comes along with something seductive, sexual. Now, I'm going to show you that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and Genesis 3, there is absolutely no doubt here. Okay, this one, there is absolutely no doubt. There is something sexual going on. That one is a matter of fact. But I want to say is, I have no idea on the specifics. And I want to make that extremely clear. A lot of people think that I teach this or I teach that, but that's not true. All right? It's because you don't pay attention. Now, there was something sexual, sexual within the relationship of the woman and the serpent, but I have no idea what the specifics are. So I'm going to give you several cases. The first case is the word beguile. That's the thing. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, notice what the Bible says at verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent, what? Beguiled Eve through his subtility. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the serpent beguiled Eve. That's the first step. The second step is even stronger. So I'm going to write the steps here and give some cases for this creature here. The first step from what I see is the word beguile. The second case of what I see here is actually the context is extremely strong. There's no doubt about context. Let's look at the two passages. 2 Corinthians 11. The word beguiled Eve, right? But notice this has to do with something sexual at verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a what? Chaste. Chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul intended where they are sexually free and that they are chaste and that you are faithful to one husband. However, there's a cheating going on at verse 3. Just like what Eve did with the serpent. That's what the Bible's saying. It doesn't make sense to me. What doesn't make sense to me is how did Eve cheat? Who did Eve cheat on to go for the serpent? There's something going on here. Let's look at Genesis 3. Even the text itself, the whole chapter, if you actually look at the whole context, there's strong allusions here. Look at Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to show you this. Some of them you didn't know before. Now, notice what God says to the serpent. God is speaking to the serpent at verse 14, right? All right, I'll expound on that later. But look what God says to the serpent. This is strange here at verse 15. And I will put enmity. So he's saying that 
there's going to be an enemy, a division between thee and the woman. So he's making an enemy between the serpent and the woman, but it refers to basically sexual reproduction here. Look what sexual reproduction is included here. And between what? Thy seed and her seed. Why would he mention seed here? As the judgment. Why would God, if there's anything that God can specifically judge the serpent for. It's a billion things, but why does it have to do with something sexual? Sexual reproduction here with the devil's seed that brings forth and then the woman with her separate line. Why would God put this tension between them? That's very weird. But here's another one. It's what he punished Eve. And notice that the serpent and Eve what they both had as a punishment had to do with sexual, sexual, sexual. That's the word that can be included here. But with Adam, it's not. It has to do with him working for a living. But look at verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy what? Conception. It's sexual reproduction here. So then she has to have pain for that one. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Why would God put attack and judge specifically for the sexual area of the woman? And for the serpent too. Second punishment is the relationship. Sexual intimate relationship. And thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. That's weird. Why, would, why is it that man has to be control over the uh, woman and make sure to take leadership. Now, I know that sounds discriminatory right now, but it's not what you think. I'll explain that a little later, okay? But why is it that the man has to take charge of his wife and to make sure that the woman submits to him? There's something going on here because she went outside of his control. There's something that, and then God has to put the division of the control with the serpent and the woman. And look at the matching here, 1 Timothy 2. Look at the matching here. It's so. If there is one word, one word that can be very appropriate for any for all the punishment, all the punishment of the serpent and the woman, it has to do with sexual. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Notice at verse 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. Verse 13, for Adam was first formed then Eve. Now look at this, verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith. Now notice here that the negative aspect of what God gave to the woman here matches, same thing, Verse 12, it's a relationship with husband and wife. Uh, if you especially look at verse 11 and 12, right? It's a relationship of husband and wife. And then at verse 15, it's, uh, raise, it's bringing forth children. Matches up again. And all this follows within the deception of the woman from Satan at verse 14. Now, the, the argument against... This indication here is that, well, then you're saying that Adam fell into something sexual with the devil as well. But the thing is, is verse 14, notice Adam was not deceived. See that? He wasn't the one beguiled and charmed. It was the woman. So I just see so much here. But going back to Genesis 3, if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, there's, there's strong allusions but I just don't know what it is. But there are strong illusions about what's going on that's sexual. If we were to continue down about the woman and the serpent, another thing to take notice with verse 13 where the serpent beguiled Eve is also the fruit. Go to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30.
We'll go to Proverbs 30. It's eating. There's something going on here. If you look up with grapes, that one, for some weird reason, connects to sexual again. It's very, very strange. You can't help but find it. There are too many passages that are rich about something sexual that can connect with grape. It's very weird. Very, very weird. It's also weird where they call concerning about serpent snake charmers. Or there's something seductive about a serpent, which is very disturbing. Usually you'll see what? Sometimes they'll, uh, back then or even today, they'll try to show images about a naked woman with a serpent wrapped around her. There's something weird. Very, very weird stuff and dark behind it. Now, take it for granted. I'm not going to teach it in this lesson because you saw it in different Genesis, previous Genesis teachings. Taking it for granted that the woman ate grapes, right, as a forbidden fruit, what does the Bible say about this aspect can, with the woman? Can it be something sexual? Yeah. Look what the Bible says. It connects it to something sexual at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Notice what the Bible reads at verse 20. Such is the way of a what? An adulterous woman. Did you notice that? So it's sexual. She what? Eateth. And wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. Look at this. It's a similar, Proverbs 30 verse 20 is similar to what Eve did. She ate the grapefruit and then she wipes the mouth and then she gives the excuse, I didn't do anything wrong. That's what everybody does at court when they're found guilty, right? Especially those who are truly guilty. I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't be helped. It was something else. So very strange stuff here. It connects to something sexual. But look at Habakkuk. Look at Habakkuk. If there is a sin, okay? Now use your heads now, okay? Use your heads. Drunkenness accompanies with grape, with the vine. That's the sin that accompanies it. If there is drunkenness, what other sin is there that accompanies it? It is sexual. If you don't believe me, look at today. When people drink, why do they put drinking and mingle it up with uh, sensual nightclubs and etc.? Why do they have to create that kind of atmosphere? Yeah. Because the vine, the alcohol, etc., what it does, it's supposed to create that vibe. Everyone knows there's something sexual connected to it. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at verse 5. Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine. See, that's grapes. He is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell. Reading down, we go down to verse, uh, let's see here. Verse, not, uh, oh, I think I skipped it. Ah, here it is, verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, all right, that's speaking about that fermented grape juice, so that's wine back then, that putteth thy bottle to him and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their what? Nakedness. So notice here, this has to do with basically sexual sin. Now what happened to Adam and, uh, what happened to Adam and Eve? They found out about their nakedness. As soon as they partook in the grape, that's one thing we know about Eve. It's weird, but there's another one. Uh, there's too many weird stuff. We're going to look at Proverbs, uh, Amos 9. Amos 9. And then go to Matthew 26. Amos 9 and Matthew 26. I remember I have, I have a video called Satan Has a Son, and that's probably been the most viral video. And a lot of people, they were just saying, whoa, what is this kind of stuff? And th what you're hearing right now is from that video. But I'm expounding it a little bit more and then smoothing it out a bit. So we're going to look at Matthew, uh, we're going to look at Amos chapter 9. If we were to look what the Bible reads about grapes, it is very interesting at verse 13. Notice the words connected with grape. 
It has to do with seed and bloodline. Very strange. Is there no doubt, can we all agree with this? As soon as uh, Eve partook the fruit from the grape, it changed mankind's seed and bloodline. So then they, that's why God, he demanded innocent blood, not human blood sacrifice. It was defiling to him. He wanted innocent blood because our blood is corrupt. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 15 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Is that a gold mine? Uh, look at Amos chapter 9. Look at the wording of company at verse 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman should overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth what? Seed. It's connected there, seed and grape. Look at Matthew 26. Jesus wanted people to know that the literal grape juice he was drinking, it would represent and picture what? His own human blood. How about that? Look at Matthew chapter 26. His blood was basically God's blood though. It's definitely different from normal human blood. That's the reason why we have to go by his blood and not by current human blood. Otherwise, uh, the Lord sees this as something defiling, mm -hmm. corrupt. Why? Our blood got changed from the serpent back then. It was corrupt blood. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Look at verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament. But look at the wording. It's connected to the vine. Verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. How about that? All right, going back to Genesis 3 again, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 13. So there's too many cases building up here. The last one will probably be the, the most interesting one. Now, uh, to go back to the argument about the critics, how they would use Adam, uh, there's one more thing that I forgot. Remember, uh, we're not going to turn to that passage because we did it in our previous Genesis study. Did you remember Ezekiel? I think the chapter is 31. Satan is represented as the what? The tree in Eden. Mm -hmm. See, and then Eve partook its fruit, mm -hmm. its seed, its blood. Mm -hmm. See, there's something going on. Now, the critics, obviously, then they'll argue, then you're saying that Adam... Because he did the same thing too, which is true with the grapes, then you're saying that something sexual went on with Adam too. But from how I see it is this way, from how I see it is that, yes, it is true that Adam partook in the fruit, but I think that in Adam's case, he just simply ate the fruit off the tree. With Eve, she ate the fruit uh, off the tree too, but in her case, there was something in between the line that was sexual. You might say, why is that? Because I showed you already 1 Timothy 2, is that Eve was the one that was beguiled and charmed, but not Adam. So when Adam, you got to understand this too, when Adam partook in anything that would be sexual here, it was with Eve. It was with Eve. Because Eve was the one that got him to partake in the fruit. So with this sexual connotation, whatever it is, all right, so some people, see, they think that I'm talking about where, it, where I mean something sexual, like a body conjoined with another body. But no, that's not what I mean here. Well, concerning something sexual here, it could be some kind of other ways or other means to do it. Because we're talking about a supernatural realm over here. Uh, not just normal human interaction. Even with animals and plants and everything that we see today, where they would be what we would call uh, sexual integration or something like that. They all don't do the same operations and workings. Yeah. All living entities and beings, they have their own ways of doing things. So Satan did something weird, which I don't know. But he did something weird that was sexual. So I don't know what the specifics are. I don't know what the specifics are. Anyways, uh, if we look at Genesis 3, this is the most wild one, but perhaps the most interesting. Notice that within the lost people's condition where the bloodline and the sea was corrupted, we were corrupted by the serpent then. So being corrupted by the serpent, what are we called? Go to Matthew 23.
Go to Matthew 23. Look, look what the Bible calls us. If you're a child of the devil, see that? Or from the bloodline and the seed of Satan, then notice what's going on here. You are called what? Serpents, vipers. Isn't that weird? Why would Jesus call children of the devil that? That is so strange. Because the Lord saw it as something what the serpent did. That where corrupted the bloodline and the seed of mankind. That we carried it on and became the child of the devil. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Notice what Jesus said at verse 33. Ye serpents, ye, notice he calls it generation. See that? Generation of vipers. How can he escape the damnation of hell? Very, very weird. You know what also is interesting? Uh, I do not have a passage on this one from the top of my head. But if you look up, the, uh, there are verses in the Bible that puts together the word worm and serpent. Isn't that weird? Why? Because if you look at this picture, kind of, I mean, especially with the head and all that, it kind of looks like something where there's a worm and a serpent thing. They look very similar to each other. Now, obviously, I know that the, uh, those beasts are different, but the thing is, is that they have a similarity, which is weird. They have an appearance and a similarity that's weird. They crawl. They slither on the ground. That's the thing. They have this a snake entity that slithers on the ground. But uh, if you doubt me, just look up the word worm and serpent, and you'll find a verse on that. It's very, very strange and weird that the Bible would uh, put the two together. The Bible also says at Mark chapter 9, what are you? Uh, you can turn over there if you want to. To Mark chapter 9. So notice your serpents for hell, right? At Matthew 23. Is that correct? Serpents for hell. Notice that the Bible assimilates that with worms in hell. Worms in hell. He also calls you worm. So there's no doubt. There's a relationship somewhere here in the scripture even though I know that scientifically speaking or in the scientist's point of view, it's different. But in God's point of view, he sees them as something that's sharing the same relationship. We're going to look at Mark chapter 9, and we'll read at verse 44. Mark 9, 44. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Very strange. It's very strange here. If that be the case, then look at the children here. We're going to look at John 8. There's John chapter 8. And then the next one will be 1 John. 1 John 2. 1 John 2. We're going to look at John chapter 8. And then we're going to look at 1 John 2. Now notice what Jesus called uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He called them that their father is Satan. And it may be possible because Jesus called them serpents and vipers that they could have been somehow literally uh, the devil's children at verse 44. You are of your father the devil and the lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not the truth. Now, notice Satan is called a murderer, and he's known as their father. And notice who else is a murderer and who his father would be. Look at Cain, 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, 1 John 3, excuse me, 1 John 3. Notice at verse 12. Verse 12. Notice the Bible says, not as what? Cain, who, look at the wording here, was of that wicked one. And what did he do? He murdered. What? Why? Because his father's the devil. Murder from the beginning. So Cain followed along. So here's the weird teaching here, okay? But it's possible. Dr. Elkman pointed out the possibility 
but he didn't teach it as doctrine. And I want people to understand that, all right? Did you hear what I just said? So this is a possibility, okay? I'm not saying that this is true. What I do know to be true, let me repeat it again. What I do know to be true is that there's something sexual, okay? That much I do know to be true. And these four things I agree with. There's something going on. But a little bit over here is where it gets fuzzy, the specifics of it, that I don't know. So here's the possibility. The possibility is that Cain and then the Sanhedrin or certain parts of the Pharisees or let's say that there is a bloodline over here. And this bloodline is the serpent's seed. So you'll hear that amongst the conspiracy realm too about that there are the serpent seed and they'll claim that there are some who are alive today within the elitist world. Now, me, I don't go that far. I believe that it could be possible. I believe it could be possible. But the reason why I don't go that far is because, let me explain several things here, okay? Let me go one at a time, all right? Because this is very deep. And we'll expound this a little bit more in Genesis 6. One, there is no doubt that the serpent had a literal seed. That much we do know. The reason why is because of Genesis chapter 6, of uh, the sons of God intermingling with humanity. So then the serpent had his literal seed. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, the serpent has a literal seed in the future as well. They mingle with humanity. If you look at the book of Deuteronomy and Numbers, there is absolutely no doubt. There were these giants that followed the earth in those days with Genesis 6. Now why is it that I don't go as far to say as they're alive today? In other videos, it, might, it kind of sounds like that I would do it. but. Uh, what I'm pointing out here is I'm not sure right now because if you look at those passages, their job was to uh, annihilate the serpent seed, remember? That's why the Jews did annihilation. Why? Because it's to wipe out the serpent seed. That's why it makes sense at Genesis 6, huge flood. Why? To wipe out the serpent seed. So it's very strange stuff. So there is no doubt a literal serpent seed, but where it gets fuzzy is who's who. Who's who? Cain could have been one of them. And the Pharisees could have been one of them. That's possible. But like I said, it's a question mark. Okay? So, and then we don't know up to what point today and back in the past on how much the serpent seed has affected physical bloodlines. So these are the three areas. We just don't know. And that will open up a huge can of worms over there. And I indicated in my teaching that if we were to say, so if, so I'm not saying it is, but if it is the case that the serpent seed is not annihilated, no matter how much they try to wipe it out, and there's a certain blood drop or a little bit of infection where all of us may have partaken in that, then that would explain why in this flesh the devil can demon possess it. And why the Lord, he did not save your flesh. And it's considered, uh, it's considered to be defiled and wicked. And the only thing that's holy is within you, the spiritual nature. And he divided your fleshly nature from the, spirit, uh, the spiritual nature from the fleshly nature. And that's the reason why he has to turn this to dust. Why? Because dust shall be the serpent's meat. So it has to be all tapped down there. Turned to dust and then transformed at the rapture. Now that goes really deep over there. So I'm not going to go verse by verse and go through all of this. The reason why is I don't believe it too much myself. But I believe in giving you everything of what the Bible can show to you because that's my job as a pastor. So that much I tried to tell you from all the words out of my mouth. So that's where it can get really deep over there. And that's why all of creation it needs the Savior and that can only happen at the millennial. Now understanding that... What I do know is, this is a question mark, but I do know for a matter of fact, a matter of fact is this, and all these four, so what we can find out is this, all these four cases can go with something sexual, but even more stronger than that, which makes it more simple, and everyone will believe this, even Billy Graham will believe this, it's <laughs> spiritual. So all of this transaction that took place, the Lord saw it as something where he saw it as something as fornication, as something corrupt, filthy, 
and that the bloodline and the children of Satan was brought forth through this interaction, but this is all a spiritual transaction. So that makes things the most simpler. So it makes things the most simpler. So you might say, why don't you go for the spiritual interpretation then? Why do you have to put something where it's like some kind of physical or some sexual thing which is pretty strange? And when I say physical, I mean that very loosely. I don't mean body interacting with body. But the thing is, the reason why I would put this in here is because Genesis 3, that, word, that verse that I gave to you going back there, Genesis 3... And verse 15 is what bothers me. This is what bothers me. Remember I told you Genesis 3.15, that's the sexual indication, right? Genesis 3.15, you remember that? If that's a sexual indication, then look at this. This is not spiritual. This is physical, literal. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between, and between thy seed, let's say that spiritual, and what? Her seed. Then you make that physical, literal? You can't do that. We know, uh, we know that uh, her seed is physical and literal. That's Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. If we were to follow context, not bias. See, we have to get rid of bias. And we completely went by the context and the flow of Scripture. You can't just all of a sudden say the serpent's seed is spiritual and then you switch it all of a sudden to a physical seed with the woman no it makes more sense it's talking about the same context of the seed here it's physical that's what bothers me see that that's what bothers me that's the reason why i opened up this one right here there's something that happened to which how much the specifics are i don't know okay you learned a lot <laughs> but continuing on with genesis 3 let's bypass all this now okay we're done we're done that was a lot that was a lot of stuff. But when we come to Cain and Abel, then, that's why it could be very strange here that with Cain, where he had the, if he did carry the literal offspring of Satan, because he was of that wicked one through that interaction with Eve and the serpent, and then Abel, he's the one that came out with uh, innocent and righteous blood after that. But anyways, uh, that's another story. We'll go to Genesis 4, okay? When we talk about super fecundation and twin birth and all that, that's where it gets some interesting stuff. But we'll do that later. Verse 14, right? So 13, I explained the interpretation. Now we're going to get down to verse 14 and get this going. And the Lord God said unto the serpent. So now the Lord, he speaks to the serpent. He got to Adam. He got to Eve. Now it's the serpent's turn. Because thou hast done this. See, it's something that the serpent did. That's why the God gave him a specific curse at verse 15 that related to sexual repro re, uh, reproduction here. See that? Because of what he did. So that's why there's something strange. Because thou hast done this, so whatever the serpent did with the woman, right, at verse 13, what is it that thou hast done, right? To the woman, she did something. And then to the serpent at verse 14, because thou hast done this, there's too much indication here. There's too much indication. It's, it's not just something simple to bypass. There's something deeper. But anyways, keep reading on. Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. So because the serpent has uh, done that cry, God says you're cursed above all categories of creatures. And the category of creature, notice, is that he's in the cattle and beast of the field. And I've explained that in previous Genesis teachings. That's the reason why Satan, who's within the repti aquatic reptilian class, he's also labeled with cattle here. And then you compare that with Ezekiel 1 and 10 about the ox that has horns. And that's the reason why the Satan, he'll come out as a serpent but with horns. That's the idea. But that's uh, in previous Genesis teaching, right? I'm not going to expound it again. Returning back here, uh, notice that the serpent is below these categories of creature. And upon thy belly shalt thou go. So it's going to go upon its belly. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the serpent's going to crawl around its own belly. And the serpent's going to constantly eat dust uh, all the moments of its life. Now, it could be possible, it could be possible that this could be a scientific uh, proof text in your Bible 
about the serpent. That's the reason why it crawls along its belly or that it used to have legs back then, but then it would crawl around its belly and then that's why it has to eat from the ground. That's where the dust is. However, when you compare scripture with scripture, Dr. Upman believes differently. That it's not a literal serpent, but basically, like I told you in previous Genesis studies, it's more like a title attributed to Satan. Because look at Isaiah 65. That's the reason why. Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65 shows that it's not happening now to the serpent. It's happening in the future. And the idea about dust shall be the serpent's meat, the idea is, is how we use it today. Like, you're going to eat dirt. Why? When you get the victory against somebody. When you're like going to really crush somebody and pound them. Wow. So look at Isaiah chapter 65. Look at verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And look at this. Dust shall be the serpent's meat. Did you notice that? And by the way, look at Micah 7. Micah chapter 7. I don't know if that's the passage. Let's look at it quickly. Look at Micah chapter 7. I don't know if this is the text here. I have a feeling it's a different one. Let's see here. Micah chapter 7 and... Uh, no, it's not. So I got the wrong one. But it's verse 17 about the serpent and the worm likened together, if you want that. Micah 7, 17. You notice that? Serpent and worm. All right, but anyway, going back, all right, not important. <laughs> going back, uh, there's another passage in the Bible that shows that uh, the devil's children, that the lost sinners at the last days of the millennium, the Bible calls them serpents, and they're going to eat dust. That's what the Bible says. So there's no doubt that this is not talking about something where a snake crawls along the ground and then eats dirt. It's more to the point of, that Jesus Christ reigns and conquers his enemies, and then he's basically telling them, you're going to eat dirt. I'm going to make you eat dirt. That's the idea. Okay, uh, go, going back at Genesis 3. So we realize that Isaiah 65, that's future. That makes a lot more sense. It's a future where God judges the serpent. That I'm going to get the victory over you. You thought you won, but guess what? I'm going to make you eat dirt one day. And then verse 15 is definitely future. And I will put enmity. So he says that uh, there's going to be an enemy division. Why? Because the woman and the serpent were united before for some weird reason. He wouldn't say enmity unless they weren't united to begin with. If you compare that with James 4, the wording is strong. Enmity with the, uh, it's enmity with God when you're uniting together with the world. And he calls it adulterer and adulteresses, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So see, there's too much sexual connotation. There's just too much from Scripture with Scripture. But going back, uh, Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. So he's going to make sure that the woman and the serpent, that they become enemies against each other. That's what enmity means. It's to make enemies. So he's going to put that between them. And between thy seed, so the serpent seed, physical and literal, as I've explained before, there's going to be an enemy between his seed and what? Her seed. So Eve's seed, Eve's bloodline. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. heel. There's just too much wording here. Um, uh, I don't have time to cover it in this teaching. Um... I will have to expound that next Genesis because this will take a while. So this is the, mess, uh, the messianic bloodline here. So notice that if the Christ has his own bloodline, so will the imitator of Christ will have his bloodline. That's why the Antichrist is called son of perdition. Genealogy, bloodlines, there's just too much over here. And that's why Satan has to do sexual reproduction at Daniel chapter 2 during the Antichrist reign. Okay, that's a lot. Just let that go bypass your head. All right, we'll expound a little bit more, all right? You don't have to really understand that now, okay? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for uh, the truths of your word on how amazing it is and how much learning 
that needs to be done. And open uh, thou our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.